Oh, good. Thank you. Be powerful. I'm going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to look at chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 10 onwards. It's on page 264 in the Pew Bible. I'm going to be reading from a different version this morning, but the message is the same. So if you want to follow, it's Ephesians chapter 6. So this is basically in um, the book of Ephesians, the writer is Paul. He's writing mainly to the people in Ephesus, which was one of the towns, one of the major towns in uh, what we know today as modern day uh, Turkey and parts of uh, Greece and all of that. So Ephesus was one of those port towns. And Paul, in one of his missionary journeys, he goes there and he plants a church. He starts a church, literally, that started from him speaking in the temple, and he plants this church. And this is close to the end of, of um, his, his time, and we will talk a little bit about it just now. But he says, finally, finally be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the devil's day, in the, in, in the evil days. And having done all that, Stand firm, stand therefore, having fast on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the, of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayers and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chain that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, open my lips to declare your praises. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you notice in the beginning it says, Finally, finally, why is he saying that? Because, as I said, Paul was in his missionary journeys, and in one of his missionary journeys, he goes to this town, the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the major towns in those days. It was a port town, and because it was a port town, it was very important. People were coming in and out, trading, all sorts of things. Ephesus was also the worship capital of that time. And they worshipped the, the gods, one of the many gods of the Greeks and the Romans worshipped in those days. It was, a, it was a beautiful temple for Athena, which was one of the goddesses that would, would worship. The people would come and they would worship in that, in that temple. And they would have to go in order to worship. There were prostitutes who would be called priestesses of the temple. So you can imagine what was going on in that time with regards to immorality and sexuality and, and all that kind of stuff. There were many educated people who were coming to Ephesus as well over that time. And Paul would have planted a church, but what happened is from Ephesus, he went to Jerusalem and he was arrested on a temple mount in Jerusalem because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was arrested and he was taken to a place called Caesarea, which is in Israel, and it was also a port town. Herod the Great built 
Caesarea for Caesar. He wanted to show off what he could do. And he built this beautiful town. There's huge excavations that were found eight kilometers into the sea. There were excavations that were found underneath the water, underneath the bed of the sea. And they were excavated years ago. Beautiful ruins. Often when I go to Israel and with a tour, I take people there. That's where we stop our tour. Because you can literally walk on the beach and you can find seashells, but you can also find um, the pots and, and, and things like that, and coins. Because there's just so many of those from those, those times. But, G, but, 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 but Paul was now awaiting his arrest. He was awaiting the trial. Because remember, if you know your scripture, Paul was a citizen of Rome. As much as he was a Jew, as much as he was a disciple of Jesus, not in the twelve disciples, but a, a student of Jesus, he was a Roman citizen, and because of that, he was granted trial. And then he was waiting to be taken to Rome. And while he's in chains, he writes this book called Ephesians. And and if you if you look at Ephesians, he tells different things throughout Ephesians. But he gets to this chapter 6 and he says, Finally! And you never notice that whenever a minister preaches, and it's already over an hour that he's preaching, don't worry, I'm not going to do that today. And then he says, Finally! I think, okay, that's great, now he's going to stop. And for the next 20 minutes, he still carries on. Yeah. Not me, I can never do that. <laughs> Well, Paul is doing the same thing here. He says, finally, in other words, I'm about to close this book and finish this book, but finally let me leave you with these words. Usually indicating that now in the light of everything that I've said in the last five chapters, let me finally give you these application, this conclusion, this summary. Now, I don't know about you, but Paul is going to now talk to us about a spiritual war. A war. A spiritual war. A war that is not fight, fighting with guns and weapons, not like the war that is in Ukraine at the moment and in the different parts of the world. No weapons needed from that man perspective. But Paul is going to talk to us in Ephesians 6, in this, in this condensed few verses, powerful verses, that often I think the church doesn't understand what we actually have in our hands. The arsenal that we have available to us. And Paul will remind us here of the war, the spiritual war, a war that is not fought against flesh and blood, but in the spiritual world. It's a spiritual world that is constantly, constantly being fought. I don't know if you've ever, if ever, if ever, if ever realized that sometimes when you actually tend to get closer to God in your walk, that something happens and you get sick and you just can't get out of that sickness. Okay? And we've all that experienced that in the last few weeks. Whenever you feel, now, nah, okay, I'm having a breakthrough with Jesus. I'm having a breakthrough in my marriage. I'm having a breakthrough in my life. I'm having a breakthrough in my, in my workplace. And all of a sudden, there is this attack. You can't call it anything else but that attack. Weird things are happening. Things that shouldn't happen are happening. And you're wondering, what am I doing wrong? I mean, I'm, I'm getting closer to God. You see, I often say that the devil doesn't need you to send any demons your way. All he has to do is just plant a little bit of doubt. That's all he has to do. Doubt in yourself, doubt in your circumstances, doubt in the people around you, doubt in your church. And that's all he has to do. Because what's the opposite of faith? Doubt, isn't it? You know, I often find I am trying to, to be a bit more aware of it now in my life so it doesn't happen as, as often. But 
that in the early, early stages, on a Sunday, myself and my family are on a witness attack. As I said, no, no, we're getting better at it because um, myself and Tammy are getting more wary of the spiritual attack and we sort of, before we, we do anything, we pray. But we used to argue a lot just before going to church. The kids were the most unruly on a Sunday morning trying to get ready to church. I'm sure you did have that. Uh, you know, your kids are uh, uh, adults, you know. But it, what, why was that happening? Because what was happening is Satan doesn't want me to do what I'm about to do and speak what I'm about to speak, and so there's an attack. One of our other ministers in this time has been under a tremendous attack for the last few years in his health. Why? Because he's making a stand for Jesus like he never made it before. And like I said, Satan doesn't need to send any demons, but he just needs to do this one little thing to create this, this thing. So we are in a war, and there is a struggle in the war, and you need to consider the fight, or the war, or the struggle, or whatever you want to call it, spiritual warfare, which is what we're talking about. Now look at verse 12, if you're still following, and it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, the cosmic powers, and so on. So what is Paul saying here? It's not that we are talking about, we're not fighting about, you know, let's say in, 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 a, in a particular circumstances at work, there is this, this thing that you are not able, your company is just not moving. And yes, you can blame it on COVID, you can blame it on the economy, you can blame it on the start, but there is something else that is happening there. All of a sudden, there's people in your, in your work that are just lethargic, they're just like not doing anything. The same people, the same work, you've managed to get through the worst of time, COVID and so on, but for some reason now, lately, they just people are just, there's that Afrikaans word that I wasn't going to mention last week yet. You know what I'm talking about. Something cool. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who can't speak Afrikaans. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? And what do you think that is? That is exactly what Paul is talking about in saying what we do wrestle is not flesh and blood. It's not the training of the people in, in, in your company or, or the kids or the wife or the husband or the home or the school or whatever. It's not that. Lately, the number one thing we pray for schools when we go around schools and we pray every now and again on, on, on Tuesday, is about spiritual warfare. It's about spiritual warfare, about this cosmic powers. So in other words, a conflict in which we find ourselves, rather than being a denial of our faith, should actually, in a strange way, be an evidence of our faith. Because if we re recognize it, if we understand it, and if we know that this is the war that we're fighting with, then we better equip for it, isn't it? Now why is this happening? Because, as Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, Paul writes that as well, is we are no longer slave, we are not the sons of disobedience, we have been transferred from that. We are no longer in the kingdom of darkness, we have been transferred to the kingdom of light. We are no longer following the way of the prince of the evil ages, we are now following Followers of Jesus, we're no longer in this camp. We are in Christ's kingdom. And having been placed in the kingdom, now we find ourselves in that war. You see, when, when you're not in line with Jesus, Satan doesn't bother about you. When you're not in church, and you haven't been in church for a long time, Satan doesn't bother with you. Why? You, you do fine for me. You're just sitting there, not doing anything, you're not, you're not being an ambassador for your Christ, you're just there. But when you start getting up and getting ready to stand and live life and fight the spiritual battle, guess what? The enemy doesn't like it. 
the enemy does not. I mean, look what is happening to use a modern day understanding of war. Look what's happening in Ukraine. No one believed that Ukraine was going to be able to withstand the mighty power of Russia <coughs> up until now, it's over 100 days. Why? Because no one understood that Ukraine was, was solidified. Often I've been asked, why is Israel had so many wars against it, and so many attacks and so on? Why has it always been able to withstand it? Because when there is any kind of war in that country, the people are unified. The people stand together. The people defend their country. Same as Ukraine. They defend in Ukraine. And God is saying, and Paul is telling us that this is the fight that we are fighting. And why are we fighting it? What is the struggle? We are no longer a part of the world. We are now part of the kingdom. We are part of Christ's kingdom. And if we place in that kingdom, we now find ourselves in this intense struggle. Not against human beings but against demonic forces, demonic intelligence, against the evil one. So that's the struggle, but what about the strategy of it? Okay, well, that's the fight, but the strategy of the believer in these circumstances, well, <coughs> Paul summarizes it well in Ephesians chapter 6, where he stand, says, stand firm. Stand firm. So what, are we just to stand and wait? Or are we to stand firm on what? On the world. Stand firm on the fact that we are in this war, but we are not alone in this war. Stand firm in the fact that we don't just stand and do nothing, but we stand and do something. We pray. We realize where we are and so on. Now, how do we do that? How do we stand firm? In verse 10 it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Not your strength. Not your strength, but in the strength of His might. Who is His? God's might. You know what? The funny thing about this battle, it's already been won. It's already been won. So why are we to fight? Why, why are those things happening if it's already been won and we're already victorious? Why? Anyone want to take a guess? Because as much as Christ is victorious, as much as, and we spoke about it for the last few weeks, as much as Christ has risen from the dead, He conquered dead, as much as Christ then, then ministered to the people, as much as Christ ascended, and as much as Christ ascended, and as much as Christ poured His Spirit upon us, the, the bottom line is, the end days hasn't come. And we are finding ourselves between that, that the battle has been won, and indeed that. There's maybe about four or five of you guys that will know what I'm thinking about D-Day. You were probably still alive in those D-Day. But, but on D-Day, I mean, there was Victory Day and there was D-Day. Between Victory Day, did everyone put down the weapons? All kind of struggles were finished? No. A few here and there. But then on D-Day, that's it. There was no more war. There was celebration, there was victory, there was, there was liberation. And that is what we're finding ourselves in the spiritual battle between the victory day, Christ has won, Christ has risen, Christ has poured His Spirit upon us, 
Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But D-Day, when D-Day comes, that day that every knee, as we said, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, that's D-Day. On D-Day, unfortunately, Jesus is going to stay there and say, you, on this side, you, I don't know, that side, you, okay, stay in the middle. <laughs> no, it's not going to be a middle. It's not going to be a middle. That's it. D-Day is over. The struggle is over. Yesterday, I did a funeral for a guy who used to be in that congregation years ago, before even I came. And he was one of the guys from the Ghanaian community. I didn't know him personally, but I did a funeral and when we stood at the gravesite, and I said, you know, Martin Luther was one of the theologians, he says that when we die, we are ushered from the kingdom of the dead to the kingdom of the living. For that man, that was the day. Okay? He is in the glory and the presence of the living God. But for us, we are still here. One day is one day, and that day is that day. And Paul is saying, until that time, stand firm. Stand firm. Now, the clip that, that I played in, in, in the beginning is from a movie called The War Room. Has anyone seen that movie? If you haven't seen that movie, please, if you've got Netflix, it will be on Netflix. If you've got YouTube, you'll be able to download it from YouTube. Watch that movie. It's an amazing movie that basically talks about the spiritual warfare. And this lady that was praying, she had this war room. She had this place in the cupboard that she would sit in the cupboard and pray and pray and pray. And I don't want to give away the story. But what is a war room? It's, it's, it's this command center. Okay? It's this command center that depending on how sophisticated the army is, you either going to have different screens and touch screens, or you'll have different soldiers and the map of the world and all of that. And what would the generals do and the commanders and chiefs will do and the president of that country will do? They will strategize. They will work out a plan in this war room. And in a way, this is what Paul is saying is in the meantime, stand firm, but don't just stand there. Go into this war room. Start planning. And Paul, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, and I recommend for you to read the book of Ephesians. Beautiful, wonderful, encouraging book. But in the first three chapters of the book, Paul basically tells the reader, the people in Ephesus, as he tells them about their identity. You are no longer slaves. What are you? You are children of the living God. You are God's people. And not only does he say to them you are God's people, but there is a stamp of ownership on you. And not only that, but you all have the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, he reminds them of the power that came upon them on the day of Pentecost. He says, the same power that Jesus is the same power that you have. Not only that, Paul in the first three chapters, as he reminds them of their identity, he says, you were spiritually dead. But now, you're alive in Christ. That's what you are. You're alive in Christ. Not only that, but you are one in Christ. And he says that the wall of hostility has been broken. What is the wall of hostility? In the time of the temple, the temple it had the holies of holies, the holy place, and then it had the first court, it had another court, another court. And close to the end, there was the outer court, which, by the way, this is where, where the people were selling stuff. And remember when Jesus got angry and he started, you know, 
breaking everything. And wasn't angry because it was selling stuff. They were, he was angry because they didn't realize what the purpose of them being there was. But that court, the uttermost court, was known as the court of the Gentiles. And the purpose of that court was that the Gentiles, those who did not believe in the God of Israel, were able to come and stand and look and see what's happening there. And hopefully the priests would put God on display in the right way and they would want to become a follower of the God of Israel. So, so imagine in here, instead of having sort of like mottled windows, we had clear windows and, and people were able to stand there and just watch us. And, and, and be told, why are you standing there? Come in. You're part of us. You're welcome. Everyone is welcome, and no one is perfect. And guess what? Expect the unexpected. That's, that's what we want to come. And that was the idea. But there was this wall, of, and it's called the wall of hostility, and on top it said, no Gentile beyond this point. And Paul is reminding them, not only are you was dead, but now you're alive. Not only are you getting the power, not only are you one in Christ, but this wall of hostility, in other words, anyone who is anyone can come and be a part of the kingdom of God. And he reminds them how, how, how deep and how long and how, and how wide the love of Jesus is. But once he reminds them in the first few chapters of Ephesians, once he established that identity that you are able to hear who you are, a son and daughter of the living God, then there is the calling part. And the next few chapters leading to chapter 6, Paul is talking about the fact that we are united in Christ. And he talks about one body, many parts, but one body. And that body is functioning because of one spirit. And that spirit is the spirit of the living God. And not only that, but he says, new in life in Christ. In other words, you were dead, but now as you rose, as you came to know Jesus, just like Jesus rose from the dead, now you are a new creature. Which is, by the way, exactly what baptism is all about. Baptism is physically, especially adult baptism, being immersed, is physically showing I'm dead under the water. Blah, blah, blah. I'm dead, and as I rise, I'm alive. In the old days, they actually used to do it with, with, with uh, colors of clothes, and um, they, they used to get you to wear a black and brown and sort of like heavy colors and, and, and go into the water and, and once you came out of the water then the priest will dress you up with a white gown symbolizing that now you are because white is is the picture in scripture of of, of righteousness and royalty because you are royal doesn't it be Paul tells us that we are a royal priesthood. We, we are a royal priesthood. I, I'm standing in front of royalty. <laughs> <laughs> People belong to God. I'm standing in front of royalty. We are royal. And he's saying to us, we are united in Christ. We live in the light. We used to live in the darkness, but now we live in the light, we live in His likeness. And Paul he talks about, especially in Ephesians chapter 5, he's speaking to the wives and the husband, and he says, Wives, submit to your husband. Amen. <laughs> Notice only the men say that, amen. amen. <laughs> By the way, that's completely misinterpreted. Interpreted. Interpreted. <laughs> <laughs> Aha, there we go. And how long have you been married? How many? 
59 years. Why? Submitting your husband. Don't smile at me. <laughs> there, there we go. Husband. How did he die in church? Did you hear it? Now there is a spiritual understanding here. How did Christ come to church? He gave his life for who? For her. How many bullets have you jumped in front of her? Not physical bullets. <laughs> Spiritual bullets. How many times did you stand in front of her and say, Rumbling, yeah. Satan? Yeah. You want to fight? Fight. Protecting her. 24 7. <laughs> that is a spiritual, and that is exactly what Paul is talking about. He says, understanding the spiritual battle, wife submits to your husband in a spiritual way. No, and understanding his discernment and authority. Husband, <laughs> you know it's not easy. Love your wife as, as Christ died for this church. She died. You. Husbands, we, are, we should be willing to die for our wives. Not the wives, amen? amen. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. <laughs> so he says, he's reminding them all of that. So now that you know the struggle, now that you know what you had to do, now that you have the calling, then, then Paul goes into the conduct mode. In other words, okay, are you standing firm? Which is where we are now. We in a conduct in a conduct mode, and this is where it all comes together. All from chapter one right to chapter six, it's coming together. It's in the conduct mode that you are dealing with conflict because Paul is going to look and pick up the challenge, the reality, the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil. And he's going to say to you, as you stand firm, realize that you're not fighting the battle on your own. God is behind you. Stand firm. But while you're doing that, put on the full armor of God, which we will look at next time. So finally, finally, no, how many more minutes am I allowed? Three. Finally, <laughs> it says put on the full armor of God, which is what? Oh, he says, stay there for him, fasten on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having the readiness given by the gospel of the peace, in all circumstances, take the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts. That's what I was asking. How many of those did you put? All the flaming darts and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times with all prayer and supplication. Stand firm. And he ends by saying, Will you pray for me? Because he was about to stand trial. And after that trial, we don't hear from Paul anymore. He was eventually executed. And we don't hear physically from Paul. But we are so grateful for him writings of Paul. And we will go deeper into each part of this full, not part of the full, the full armor of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God our Father, we thank you for the clarity